dear senior colleagues friends ladies and gentlemen and all the surgeons across the globe hello can you hear me satipriya yes 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 i can hear you i can okay, hear you good afternoon i can hear you. that's great that's great i bring greetings from iags today webinar is on flexible endoscopy during covid pandemic i bring greetings from all our ec members and i thank our president dr raman goyal and i thank our president and because of his masterminded activity on creating the iags covid task force and initiating this academic we are here to do the third webinar for surgeons on flexible endoscopy during covid pandemic to do this i request all the panelists to join in we have with us professor b krishna rao the father of endoscopic surgeons in india and my mentor past president and advisor of iags sir professor subhas khanna from gauhati our past president iags sir good morning and uh, he is the chairman for our iags covid task force and we have with us good morning, satyapriya good morning, good morning. satyapriya from kolkata <coughs> he is our honorary treasurer and past endoscopy board convener and we also very happy to have dr vipul roy rathod from mumbai he is a president of sgei and also he is a <coughs> very renowned person as far as the us and advanced endoscopy procedure is concerned and we have with us dr goindraj from trichy our vice president south zone good morning goindraj and also our iags endoscopy convener and dr vichay bagankar with aurangabad our dynamic endoscopic surgeon and ec member from west zone also with us so with all these people with the evidence let us take the chapter and for discussion as you all know in the last four months what started as a small cluster of atypical pneumonia cases in wuhan china has brought the whole world into its knee with its economic social and health issues and before we go into the chapter i want everyone to take these three important facts one SARS-CoV-19 is a highly infective respiratory RNA virus spread by droplet infection. And all we know so far is like a drop in the ocean. So we yet to know quite a lot. So we have to know and we have to be extra vigilant in whatever we are trying to do. And also, we are several months away from sudden cure. We are literally looking at a long channel. There is no light right, even at the end of a long channel. so we need to know where we stand before we take it further as we all understand all the government authorities are trying to do and take measures to flatten the curve it is our collective responsibility as a medical fraternity to save our patient at the same time protect our staffs with that background important message let me open the topic asking our professor krishna rao sir people say that we should stop seeing routine opd cases and also st stop doing elective endoscopy practice what's your view on this sir please uh, tell us unmute dr bikar rao all the panel members and the iags and the iags yes, members because of the unprecedented infective covid that is going around we have to protect not only ourselves but our staff in the hospital and our families so unless there is an emergency i think we should not come into contact with patients who have minor or negligible illnesses as far as the endoscopy is concerned majority of the surgeons do diagnostic endoscopy which 
can be planned at a later date when things settle down and guidelines are given as we have for hepatitis B and HIV. The infection rate is very high and the droplets that come out of the mouth and respiratory tract can travel up to nearly one meter if not more. So we have to be fully prepared to protect ourselves and also we have to be free of the disease and not communicate to our patients. That is also important. Now the routine endoscopies, diagnostic can definitely be postponed by a couple of weeks. We are going to discuss some of the therapeutic procedures that will be required to be done and I will leave it for the further discussions to go on. So the take home message that I would like to give you is seeing a patient who is not that sick who can be treated over the telemedicine or on the telephone is acceptable. Two, if the patient is very sick, he should be referred to a COVID designated hospital where they can evaluate him and do whatever is required for him on that particular period. Thank you, sir. You nicely enumerated all the reasons why we should defer elective endoscopy. And I have given the reasons here saying and also showing that the infection can travel both ways. Both the patient and also healthcare professionals are at risk from this. So we should give a strong recommendation that we should stop all elective endoscopy work and also stop seeing and reviewing routine non-urgent cases in our department. But some patients are keen to talk to us or see us. So there is a way to go about it and uh, the advice and the role of teleconsultation. I would require and request our Professor Subhas Khanna to give his views on teleconsultation. Over to you, Subhas. Thank you, Dr. Ishamurthy. And uh, um, well, uh, we, there have been apprehensions in the part about teleconsultation and uh, telemedicine. But uh, I must tell all the viewers here that on 29th of March, 2020, this year, uh, the Board of uh, Governors Medical Council of India had given a statement. Uh, in their uh, statement, they have clearly mentioned that teleconsultation of any form, SMS, WhatsApp, or any mode of uh, IT communication is permissible. It may be something like an emergency uh, permission, but it is permissible. Now, by doing a teleconsultation, uh, there are three benefits, and it's related to the need of the R. It is there. First of all, those patients who want to come to us for a re review, they just want to know about the progress, whether he's having fever, whether he's improving or not, what diet he should take, or what medicines uh, he should continue. All this can be very nicely given over a teleconsultation to the patient. Uh, we can also have a very good app by which you can have. Uh, a prescription generated for this patient because this app may contain patient identification, patient data, patient um, consultation fee can be generated and a digital prescription can be uh, given to the patient with the signature uh, of the, of the uh, consultant. And finally, uh, it's very, very important for us to screen new patients. Those new patients who want to come to us from uh, tier three CT, if they did not travel so many times during this pandemic, they can simply consult and tell us. Uh, so at least we can uh, guide them to a COVID or non-COVID hospital for endoscopy. And finally, uh, if ha you have a very good app, you can have a meetings with your uh, consultants. You can also have a satellite uh, uh, centers in the peripheral area where from the patient can sit in front of your one of your colleague consultant in that uh, small city and they can consult um, with you. Uh, I think the most important thing is this is applicable, I must say, in India at present, you cannot prescribe abroad. At the same time, uh, you cannot prescribe any uh, narcotic drug. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, thank you. Let me take, then if we stop doing the elective, then obviously we need to restrict our work mainly in the emergency and urgent indication. To give an overview, I request Vipo from Mumbai to give his views on what sort of cases you would consider for emergency or urgent endoscopy. Over to you, Vipul. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishwar Murthy and all our panelists of IIGS. It's an indeed honor and pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Uh, those who are our uh, participants today, welcome all of you. Well, as we all know that uh, uh, Dr. Rao and our previous speakers already highlighted the importance of how infective this uh, virus is. And therefore, it is very important for us to understand uh, when do we, as a clinician or an endoscopist, expose ourselves to the risk uh, in doing procedures? So, if you ask me for the time being of the lockdown period, there is no discussion on this that we should only do an emergency endoscopic procedure. And when you say emergency means what? We are talking of procedures which are life-saving procedures, such as upper and lower GI bleed, or probably impacted uh, a large foreign body in the throat or something in the esophagus, uh, acute cholagitis with severe sepsis, uh, perforations of the bowel. All these procedures can be taken up as an emergency cases for endoscopy. Well, these are emergency endoscopy. Then there are another category is urgent endoscopy. So which are the urgent endoscopic procedures which you can probably think of doing it probably a large infected world of pancreatic necrosis, or perhaps uh, putting a, a, a nasogastric or a nasogeginal tube in an obstructive GI esophageal cancer or something like that. And these are some of the procedures which you can probably do as urgent procedures, which will impact the patient's outcomes in a month's time. So you can't possibly wait for a month. And then, of course, the routine endoscopy, there is no no way we should even uh, think about it. Uh, people are trying to devise uh, ways and means. Uh, recently, there was a, uh, yesterday only I got a message that they have devised a box, uh, a transparent, uh, uh, you know, plastic uh, acrylic box, which is like a box where you can put a scope and the patient is covered with the box. So something like this, all these things probably will have to invent and then probably think uh, of taking more regular uh, endoscopic procedures. So this is by take on on which patient should be considered for endoscopy during the lockdown. And even after the lockdown is over, we need to exercise extreme caution. Thank you. That's a very nice enumerated people. I'll go yeah. over to Satipriya now. Uh, if a patient is coming and waiting in our OPD for urgent consultation in the endoscopy unit, what are the key advices we need to give to make sure there is uh, satisfactory infection prevention and control in our hospital environment. Over to Satya Priya. Yes. Uh, yes. Actually, few things we should, the uh, general rules like the social distancing we should maintain. The seating arrangement should be like that in the waiting area. And everyone should wear the, uh, the mask for the, the, for the patient and the health worker because there, there's a nicely, the slide is showing that in the, the cases where both of them don't wear any, both of them wear what it happens. And then washing of hand is also important. It takes around 20 seconds to wash all your with soap and other, and then you use the sterilizer, alcohol based. And uh, the, the social distancing and washing, these are the main important thing and the mask for all. These are the three points I feel which should be taken up during the waiting Thank area. You. Thank you, Satya Priya. That brings us, so what about the healthcare professionals? What ideal mask they should wear when they are actually working? Is it simple cloth mask, surgical mask, three-ply, or N95, or more sophisticated respirator? That's a question is lurking in the minds of many of our friends. I would ask Goindraj to tell more about N95 mask, whether can be recommended to all healthcare professionals, and how it should be worn. Over to you, Goindraj. Morning, morning, Ishwar, and morning, all the panelists. Uh, very happy to be a part of this team. And uh, first of all, before I start my lecture, uh, I would like to say, emphasize, in a pandemic like this, nothing is an emergency before you get protected. First thing is, you should wear proper PPE, that is personal protection equipment, before you enter a place which could be infected. So, important thing is, be prepared there is nothing called emergency. I didn't have time to get myself prepared. There is nothing called no time. In a pandemic, you get prepared. You have to protect yourself before you enter an infected area. One. And regarding the N95 mask, it is 
the mask which has been prescribed by world over for healthcare workers who are going to work with positive patients or patients where you don't know the status of their covid status in that case n95 according to the niosh what is niosh it is the national institute of occupational and safety health in america which is calling as n95 what does n95 mean n95 means it filters 95% of the particulate matters and the viruses so the particle that can pass through this n95 mask is should not be more than 0.3 micron size that is what an n95 mask is so when you are fixing up an n95 mask the ideal thing is you wear an n95 mask this is an n95 mask which i have here these are various types of n95 mask this is a n95 mask when you wear an n95 mask the fit is very important but when you want to know the fit according to the western standards they have a lot of methods by which they test the fit very simple method by which you test the fit is when you wear an n95 mask you make it very close to the nose kindly apply it and here in the chin and then you hold the mask in position and you breathe out and breathe in if there is not much of air escaping through the sides the fit is good this is a very simple way of testing if there is escaping of air in the top adjust that and adjust the strings there and make sure that there is no escape of air that is happening when you put breathe out the air that is very important when you are doing the n95 mask this is what is called the fitting of the mask and never you should not allow all these loose wires to be hanging around and one and the other thing is very important is after you wear this n95 mask there is a regular three ply or four ply surgical mask you apply the three ply or the four ply a surgical mask over an n95 mask because you keep touching the mask unknowingly you keep touching the mask so this mask can be touched you can throw away this mask so this mask will not get infected your n95 will not get infected so n95 is what is a niosh scoring there is an equivalent european scoring also called ffp3 or ffp2 these are equivalent ffp3 contains a odorless kind of a filter ffp2 is the equivalent to the n95 mask thank you thank you goindraj varo your nice description and we are not too far from having a custom made 3d printer printed things like that where you can have printing a part of your face like that so that spatial recognition won't be a problem so let us come to the recommendation so patients ideally should have the least a three ply surgical mask when they wait in their waiting hall and all the endoscopy staff should be encouraged to wear n95 mask probably another surgical mask over that that is the recommendation i understand we get it from here in addition we also know a lot about personal protection equipment there are some good ones there are some not satisfactory one so we need to ideally understand what are the components composition and cost of the these products in our country so to say this i request goindraj to enumerate uh these things and also tell us the right way of uh, wearing donning and doffing the ppe over to you goindraj again thank you thank you ishwar uh donning is a method by which you wear the ppe and doffing is the method by which you remove the ppe first and the foremost uh, thing which you should understand is donning should be done in a area where there are no patients there so it should be done in an area where it's outside the patient area and doffing should be done in a area which is an infected area doffing is removing of the ppe should not be done outside the infected area that's in a clean area you should not remove the uh, the uh, whatever ppe you are wearing but when you are wearing the ppe you wear it in a clean area and enter into a infected area see you can see the fort video which uh, we have done uh, yesterday this is one of my staff nurses doing it there thanks ishwar for adopting our video see you can see very much in your uh, slide there each and every stage hand scrub has been given importance there first thing is do a hand scrub with a hand sanitizer then wear the leggings that's very important after you wear the leggings again do a hand scrub and then she is wearing a n95 mask following the n95 mask she is wearing a head cap that's a head um, cap and after that she is wearing a three ply mask over an n95 mask and after that she is again applying the hand scrub and then goggles the goggles are very important because it should be a very tight fitting goggles it should not be very loose fitting also after applying the tight fitting goggles then she goes for the the ppe ppe is 
there are three layer ppe that is, can be in the layer of 75 gsm is very important 75 gsm and after she applies i enter uh, has the ppe worn her scrub nurse helps in tying the ppe from the back side and then you can see after every ppe is done there are two gloves worn first glove and the second glove and the first glove usually like you need to do when an infected case an hiv hbs agp you operate you wear two gloves the same way the pp the first glove and the second glove are applied and therein you finish off all the downing methods the downing method after you wear a cap there was a session in which it has been skipped a little bit fast where you wear a head gown you can see that scrub nurse wearing a head gown there that is also very important because the head gown covers the hair part and the neck here nape of the neck area these are areas that should be covered when you are doing a proper endoscopy because endoscopy is an agp what do you mean by agp there are two types of ppe ppe for agp agp is aerosol generating procedure endoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure and there is other thing called the ppe for non agp non agp is non aerosol generating procedure. what are the aerosol generating procedures endoscopy bronchoscopy tracheostomy tracheal suction nebulization chest physiotherapy breathing exercises these are all in agp these are all endoscopy of for these are all the ppe one for the aerosol generating procedure what i have shown here in the left on side is the endos the ppe that should be worn for an agp aerosol generating procedure now we will come to the doffing technique the doffing technique is again you do a hand scrub then you remove the second glove the outer glove then you remove the head cover then you remove the goggles then you remove the complete then you have to remove the scrub dress when you are doing removing the scrub dress you make sure that the front of the scrub dress is an infected area so you have to remove the front of the scrub dress in a folded position and remove that and then when you see the she can see the nicely the nurse is doing she wears the gloves and applies a sanitizer before she removes the outer mask and then before she removes the head, head cover these are the things before each procedure do a hand scrub and then remove the each ppe you have worn and finally you remove the leggings and then you remove the uh, the uh, final all the uh, ppes then you wear a ppe that is the basic three layer mask before you get out of your room to the outside area these are the basic things that should be done and the first glove that's the inner glove that should be worn should be removed the last thank you Ishi. thank you thank you very very nicely illustrative uh, description uh, goind raj so a good quality pp is a must by all healthcare professionals during all endoscopic procedure that would be our recommendation and coming to the case doing whenever a patient is coming to the outpatient department it is our obligation to identify whether they are high risk or low risk of harboring covid infection so we need to make a risk assessment before even touching the patient for doing an endoscopy i would request our professor bkr to tell what are the things we should expect our juniors to ask regarding the risk stratification sir over to you sir professor krishna rao sir please he has to unmute himself yeah i think he is just in the process he'll just he'll now join. yeah yes yes sir we, we are listening sir a triage of a patient should be done outside the main hospital premises probably in a tent or in a car parking area because once the infected area comes into the hospital the uh, chances of the hospital being locked down is very high as well as the staff and doctors being quarantined if a person has got symptoms of a cold cough or gives a history of a high risk country or has come into contact with a person who has had covid or suspected to have covid all of them are high risk patients and they should be treated as such the best way of treating them is to refer them to a covid designated hospital because that hospital has already been designated to receive covid patients so we should not deal with people who have a high risk uh, symptoms of travel history etc so once we have done that we are also to be sure that the risk factors are explained to the patient as to why 
he is being referred to a COVID center. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nicely said, sir. I would ask Vipul now, because there are occasions where some of the patients may be coming with a COVID symptom of GI tract. I wanted him to tell what sort of cases could appear to his department, especially a COVID patient appearing to his department. Can you just elucidate on that, uh, Vipul? Yeah. Thank you, Aishwar. Uh, as we all know that uh, in the spectrum of symptoms, uh, about 30% of patients have uh, presented initially with a GI complaint in COVID positive patients. So uh, patients who have a uh, history of diarrhea, history of uh, a lot of anorexia, nausea and vomiting, some abdominal cramps and uh, little bit of upper GI, uh, upper respiratory is, uh, suspected, uh, you know, uh, symptoms. You must think of, uh, at least in these times, you have to rule out that this patient is not uh, carrying a COVID virus. So these are some of the GI symptoms which you need to look for uh, in a patient who has COVID infection. Now, there are possibilities that the patients also may have some abnormal biochemistry early uh, abnormal bilirubin or AST, ALT, we need to keep a suspicion on them. But a very important segment of the patient who goes to gastroenterology clinics or, or surgeons are the patient with liver disease and, and, and patient who have transplants. So patient with child A, a cirrhosis, patient should not visit a, a, a hospital or a clinic if there are no symptoms. However, a very decompensated liver disease, chronic liver disease patient who has uh, ascites and some uh, infection uh, symptoms, I think they should be admitted and treated in a, in a dedicated COVID hospital as far as mentioned. Regarding the transplant patient, I would say that these are the patients who are on immunosuppression and they should be very well monitored by the treating surgeons or physicians. Regarding the inflammatory bowel disease patients, whoever is on immunosuppressive drugs for IBD, they should be closely monitored by the treating physicians and they should actually try and consider stopping those drugs if patient is on very minimal dose. Coming to the GI malignancy, same uh, philosophy applies as far as the immunosuppression and other or rather chemotherapeutic agents are concerned. I think we need to be very, very cautious that these patients are very susceptible to infection and they should be monitored closely and they should not make hospital visits. If required, defer the visit for a few more weeks if it is possible, including some uh, screening program. Suppose a patient has a, has a cancer screening program and they can possibly uh, delay the cancer screening uh, uh, for a few weeks, especially after the surgery. So this is my take on, on patients with GI symptoms and GI related problems in the COVID season. Thank you. Sir, till uh, Ishwar comes, sir, uh, 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 we, common, can, uh, yeah. uh, we can have a small discussion. So yeah. uh, since uh, we are telling about uh, not doing any diagnostic uh, endoscopy during this period, most of the surgeons who are going to be a part of this uh, webinar are going to basically do a diagnostic endoscopy so far and very few of them would be doing an, uh, an therapeutic endoscopy leave alone the few who are doing the therapeutic endoscopy focusing on the diagnostic endoscopy chunk and uh, do you think i'm asking all the panelists do you think is it possible to afford all this kind of ppe when you're doing a diagnostic endoscopy for a complete dysphagia or which is has to be diagnosed if it's going to be a malignancy and if so uh, tell me the valid points where you can cut cost and you can really uh, make sure that you are having the protection. I think Subhash, you can go on. That's fine. Uh, Govindra, uh, Govindraj and all panelists, I feel there is no question of doing diagnostic endoscopy during the pandemic area. First of all, uh, if at all we have to do a diagnosis in a particular patient, uh, the uh, we should be first depending on more of, of, of non-invasive investigation rather than investi invasive investigation. That is the first answer. So we should not be doing. If we do, we would, let's do a CT, MR, whatever needed to diagnose before we uh, venture on uh, on uh, invasive endoscopy. Now about the invasive endoscopy, yes, what uh, we have seen and what we are doing is a PPE kit, and on top of that, we are having the HIV kit so that the PPE kit can be protected. 
Now, there are some recommendations of reusing the PPE kit. Some say it can be reused five times. Some say it can be three times. So I did you do a plasma sterilization or, or, or a H2O2 sterilization. So, but then this is at your own risk. Uh, uh, diagnostic endoscopy as far as possible, avoid. But uh, there are PPE kits available at a quite cheaper rate. Uh, and uh, I feel that if at all a patient comes to me, for a diagnosis where there is a malignancy, is really worried, I'll ask him to buy a PPK and do it. Otherwise, I'll not do it. Yes, very, very valid. And uh, any of the other panelists and uh, Professor PKR, sir, your take on this. We have a, 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 a assumptive situation. The patient comes with a CT scan, which shows a lower esophageal lesion, which is obstructive. And uh, we need a tissue diagnosis for that. Maybe we need to do a diagnostic endoscopy. I'm talking about the peripheral surgery. I think the patient deserves a management of his symptoms. He has got uh, obstructive lesion on the lower end of his esophagus. He has got dysphagia, hence he is nutritionally decompromised. I would suggest that we do upper GI endoscopy, taking all precautions, uh, pass either a rise tube or if you're good enough, pass a stent, which will give him much longer period of relief. At the same time, you can take a biopsy, but again, the tissue will contain the virus and the management of the tissue is also very important when you do the biopsy on a diagnostic procedure. The procedure of this should be kept to a, as short a time as possible. Secondly, when you are doing it, as you said, aerosol is produced. So it is most important that the airway is separated by the use of an endotracheal tube and by general anesthesia so that he is on a closed circuit uh, ventilation. The infecting material, whatever it is there, is taken away and not spread to other people in the uh, endoscopy room or the operating theater. Minimum, you have to have five. The anesthetist is assistant endoscopist, nurse, nurse assistant. So for five PPE for one diagnostic procedure, he's going to cost some money to the patient. As Subhash said, if he is willing to pay for those and where we can do it. The similar thing will be if there's not an emergency procedure to be done, he can be referred to a COVID designated hospital where doctors, nurses, and others are already protected by the uh, PPE and they can manage if they have the expertise of the dysphagia. Very valid, sir. Very valid. Okay. Till we, the next point which we are supposed to discuss was the severity of COVID infection. And, uh, uh, and uh, as we know, 80% of the patients are asymptomatic carriers. Only 20% of the patients, they come with various symptoms. So uh, the next question was to Dr. Vijay, Bar uh, Vijay as to the, what exactly uh, he recommends uh, the testing for community and for any patient representing to him and what is his strategy and what are the tests available today and what is the reliability of this test? Can we go to Dr. Vijay, please? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Khanna. Uh, see, there are basically we have got two types of tests available for us. Yeah. One test tells you about the infectivity of the patient. Can you uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Second type of test. Yeah. Oh we yes, can I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, please proceed, uh, Vijay. They are about the antibody tests. So they, they tell us about the immunity of the patient towards the disease. What we are interested at present is whether the given subject is infected to us and whether it can cause some harm to the surgeon or the operating team. For this purpose, we have got the RT-PCR test, what is called as a real time. This test is done on the sputum, throat swabs, nasal swabs, or the uh, aspirations from the tracheobronchial tree. 
and uh, this test tells us whether the uh, person is positive for the covid or not now this test becomes positive on the day of infection and it has a window period of 5 days so between 1 to 5 days the test becomes positive and by the end of fourth week of the illness the test declines now there is a window period and if you have happened to test the patient in this window period in that period the another thing is the test is uh, pretty sensitive but it is the reliability is about 80% because that depends everything upon how the sample is collected how it is transported to the laboratory and uh, what and the results so the almost 80% of the uh, times we are accurate in finding out whether the given person is positive or not the second type of test these are the antigen and the antibody test the first i will come to the antibody test uh, the and whenever the person is infected with the antigen they produce they produce the antibodies and there are two types of antibodies that are produced the igm and the igg the first type of the antibody igm it is produced in the serum by seventh day after the infection and it remains in the body for about 30 to 40 days whereas igg starts occurring by 14th day and it stays in the body for pretty long time and now if you want to interpret the different tests and their utility in the clinical practice what is first necessary is that we should do the rt pcr test to find out whether this person the given patient is a covid or non covid one important thing is that the particularly for the nursing homes who are practicing this test should not be undertaken by the nursing homes or by the uh, hospitals which are not designated to take this test because there has to be a certain uh, protocol for collecting the uh, samples the person who is collecting the samples for this has to have the full protection personal protection devices and there is a method by which it is collected and sent to the laboratory because if you happen to allow this covid patient enter in your hospital and if you collect the swab then you will be in quarantine for 14 days and of course your hospital will be sealed for 14 days so this test should be done at a definite centers where they are designated if you are running a big hospital then one area of your hospital can be designated for sample collection and there you can collect the samples and then process it further about the anti about the antibodies these tests are positive as i said about 7 to 14 days after that and they tell us about the immunity of the patient uh, towards the disease for the simple thing now if the pcr is positive igm igm is negative then perhaps we are in a window period of the disease if the pcr is positive igm is positive igg is negative we are dealing with a patient with a early phase of infection if all these three tests are positive pcr igg and igm that means we are dealing with uh with the uh, active infection of the disease if the igm is negative uh, and igg is positive pcr is positive we are dealing with the late phase of the disease and only igg is positive that means this patient has a past history of uh, covid infection and now he is perhaps all right these tests are they are basically done to find out the immunity of the patient towards the disease and they are, they are mostly for the research purpose igg also can be done it can be positive on day 1 also but this test is mostly done for the research purpose and not for the clinical purposes thank you thank you vijay i think the antibody test i understand is yet to arrive and for us as a surgeon or endoscopist doing endoscopy we ideally would like to have a pcr test done priya it is ideal world but until that time i think we need to treat every emergency and urgent cases as covid positive and manage accordingly do the test then do the rest is the best policy but is it going to be a realistic scenario i would require subhas to elucidate what is our status whether we have to test everybody going for endoscopy what's your view subhas 
Thank you, Dr. Ishwara. Uh, like uh, any other viral test, I feel next couple of months, maybe three to six months, till uh, the the virus is completely eradicated from the country and from the uh, from the continents, uh, we need to do a routine pre-operative COVID test for all our cases undergoing any major endosurgical procedure. Uh, even for diagnostic endoscopy or even for proctoscopy in my center or in most of the centers, we do viral studies because we are never prepared for any patient who is a, a retrovirus positive. So I will say I will say that we should recommend a routine COVID test for all patients uh, coming for any invasive procedure in the hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Let us go on to upper G endoscopy because most of our surgeons would be doing an upper G endoscopy. And this is what we used to do in the pre-COVID era, having enough number of staffs, and that's the way we like to have it. But things are going to be different in the COVID environment. I request Dr. Goindraj to join again to tell how he would manage a case of emergency and urgent case when it comes for endoscopy. Over to Goindraj. Goindraj, are you there? Yes. On emergency, because already it has been explained in detail by uh, Dr. Vipul and others. So these are the pictures which you are seeing, which are the things which we follow in our hospital setup. And these are the few indigenous techniques which you have adopted over the start of this COVID session. And uh, if you see, she's one of my assistants uh, who is dressed up for the COVID case of an endoscopy. See, she is wearing already a complete PPE. Over that, she is wearing a disposable gown. And under the disposable gown, she is wearing a lead apron. And over the, uh, the uh, PPE, she is wearing a N95 mask. And over the N95 mask, you can see a yellow colored, regular three-layered mask. And over the three-layered mask, she is wearing a goggles. And then over that, she has got a face shield. Most of these things can be prepared in your hospital setup itself. We have got a lot of videos on that. IAGS can circulate these videos, how we can do it in our hospital setup. For example, right from a hand sanitizer, leggings, the face shield, these all can be done in our hospital setup. And uh, another indigenous technique, which we are, are seeing in the right uh, picture, in the right slide is, we are adopting an, uh, a kind of a plastic sheet. You can see my anesthetist, he uses a screen, uh, the two rods which you use for a barrier screen during a surgery. And he fills up that entire thing over that, over that uh, rod by applying that uh, plastic film. And he tucks in the plastic film on all the sides. And you can make a hole on the side, right hand side when you put a patient in the left lateral position or in the supine position or in a prone position, whichever way you want to do. And one small hole for to you to allow the endoscope in. And two bigger holes from the head and side so that the anesthetist can do an intubation. So that is very important. Here, the second point, what you have mentioned is most of the endoscopic procedures we do under anesthesia because this is an aerosol generating procedure by itself endoscopy. And you don't want the patient to become restless and difficult a difficult situation should happen during a procedure. Do in a controlled atmosphere where you can control everything that aerosol generating procedure can be controlled. So the anesthetist is protecting himself by applying a kind of a plastic sheet over which in which he is wearing all the PPE. And another thing is, you can see in another picture of my operating, of my endoscopy room, we have got minimal staff inside. Only three staff or four staff should be inside, depending on. One is me, I'm doing the procedure, and my anesthetist on the head and side, behind which you have got the anesthesia machine there. And there is an assistant holding the patient, and there is an assistant helping me. You don't need for what. This is, I'm doing a therapeutic procedure, it's an ARCP, which I'm doing there. You don't need many, many number of staff as you do it in a pre-COVID era. So reduce the number of staff who are getting exposed to the disease or to the virus if because we don't know about the status, COVID status of the patient. So you can have a minimum of two or three assistants, excluding the anesthetist. These are the few techniques which you evolve there. And I think uh, this is another indigenous technique what Ishwar has been trying to emulate or trying to do. I think Ishwar, you will be a better person to explain what you are trying to achieve in this. Thank you, no. I mean, there are some papers from Italy. They have described in a patient where a diagnostic endoscopy is done, uh, they can come with a mask, two masks, 
and the inside mask is having a mouth guard and they have a goggle but i think having discussed with the people like you i think we need to uh, give a clear cut uh, description that is the safest way of doing an endoscopy especially we are only doing an emergency and urgent care should be always under ga with et intubation this is only to discuss people will be tempted but go with a strong message that endoscopy is a high risk uh, aerosol like producing go, go procedure to the previous slide issue sure if you go to the previous slide as yeah. ripul said previously go to the previous slide previous slide so yeah you can see on the right top hand we have got a plastic sheet this is what people was telling we can have a plastic sheet or a hood which is made of an acrylic material where you have an opening for the mouth end and two openings for the head end for the anesthetist we have attempted both and probably i can send the video to the iags we can circulate it to our uh, members also with the iags uh, logo on that. thank you thank you i thank think you. we'll thank move you. on to the next important aspect the concern for uh, endoscopy especially in the covid era i request vijay what are the main key points i think the the points we already tell about the endoscopy about the benefits and risk we everybody knows can you just describe the important three aspects that has to be included in the concern form during the covid era vijay over to you vijay the covid related things can you elucidate it's okay okay i don't know Vijay, are you there? You have to unmute yourself, Vijay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Can Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Vijay. Yeah, we can, can hear. Uh, we, uh, all the endoscopy procedures they require informed, proper consent. and generally we have got two parts of this consent in first part we explain the patient the type of the procedure the benefits and the risk which are involved with the patient and if there is any alternative procedure available that patient choice have we have to give in the second part of the consent we generally have the consent for the medications the intravenous drugs that we use right from the uh, moderate sedation to the anesthesia and all the injectables that we use in the covid era we have to add now a third part in this informed consent and this consent is the patient is coming to the hospital environment because of his own emergency that we have to mention and that patient has to accept and the second thing is that by entering into an hospital environment patient is at risk to develop covid uh, in the hospital environment during the procedure and also it's a vice versa that patient also can transmit infection to the hospital staff in the concern what we have to mention is definitely that if at all patient becomes covid positive after this procedure the hospital staff and the hospital management should not be blamed for this procedure because all these uh, precautions were taken to avoid the transmission thank you thank you that is nicely yes. explained vijay uh, so i would conclude that comprehensively written informed consent form comprising all the details you just enumerated is a must and it should be signed by the patient prior to doing the endoscopic procedure let us quickly go into few indications just to give an overview to our all our uh, uh, youngsters i would request professor bkr to come back again to tell what sort of cases he would consider doing a diagnostic endoscopy in the covid era if you have five different uh, index cases a case of a chronic dyspepsia dysphagia acute gi bleed and what's his view on that over to you sir for a chronic dyspepsia the diagnostic procedure can be postponed to a particular period of time for progressive dysphagia i will go to as subhash said with a contrast ct scan to know what is the pathology whether it is a malignancy stricture or achalasia acute upper gi bleed yes definitely uh, upper gi endoscopy is required and it has to be done with all the precautions that have been stated in the past so chronic anemia is not an urgent one but it can be planned and done uh, at the time uh, after correcting the anemia in case of suspected malignancy and if the patient is very much upset about the diagnosis 
we may have to do it after explaining to him all the pros and cons of doing an apogee endoscopy during the covid era thank you sir thank you sir i will ask subhas now his view on surveillance endoscopy and also therapeutic endoscopy where the situation now in the covid era over to you subhas thanks ishwara uh, as a professor peshara said uh, we will i'll be doing or will be recommending therapeutic endoscopy only in case of a real emergency there is no question of doing any surveillance endoscopy for barrets esophagus at all and esophagus very says can wait but then if there is a bleed a patient comes to us it is a bleed from variceal bleed on or non variceal bleed we have to follow the standard protocols then stabilize the patient 12 hours 24 hours thereafter try conservative try uh, tadalipressin somatostatin uh, whatever conservative because 80% of the patient respond to conservative treatment rather than going for a invasive procedure if the patient is unstable he will his hemoglobin is falling uh, i may have to go for an invasive procedure that will be the shortest possible procedure either bending or sclerotherapy but that will be the last resort 80% of my patient i should i i will try bear my best to treat with the help of uh, conservative foreign body esophagus yes 80% of the patient uh, foreign body they pass out we know that so the the indication should be more stringent in these patients we will only take up those cases where there is a definite obstruction in the esophagus or where there is a very sharp foreign body a pin or a tooth prick uh or a very large foreign body maybe maybe larger than 2 2.5 cm which we feel that is going to get stuck uh, so there has to be a very very strong indication for doing an endoscopic foreign body retrieval from the esophagus maybe very uh, the rare the rare uh, indications where it is needed like a, a toxic battery or in ingestion of uh, some uh, narcotic drugs so for other cases i think uh i will defer my diagnostic uh, uh, therapeutic endoscopy for the time being thank you thank you as i have uh, summarized yeah. here like a traffic signal where all you can go heard and do that is perform and where you should defer and where we need to probably uh, get a patient for discussion with our colleagues i have given uh, just to conclude right. a, a remark from uh, bipul a poem for akalesia what's your view in this covid era bipul well uh, as as you mentioned rightly and even subhash said that uh, any procedure you have to understand that achalasia cardia is not an acute disease it's a it's a chronic ailment a patient has been sitting on it for for few months or probably few years so i don't think uh, there is any emergency for poem in the covid times i think we can buy few weeks we can give them some sublingual nifedipine and uh, let them manage with medical treatment and diet modification i think we can defer poem uh, in covid era for sure thank you thank you let's move on to colonoscopy and uh, i would uh, request goindraj to tell i have five different cases uh, waiting for diagnostic colonoscopy what cases you would uh, consider doing doing the covid era where we can put a pause button yeah um uh, this uh, diagnostic colonoscopy uh, like uh, like whatever uh, subhash had said and a case of first case you have mentioned is a case of bleeding pr and a case of bleeding pr if you have proper protection in your outpatient where you look at or in the emergency room where you can look at uh, the patient a proctoscopy can be done because if you have a proper protection because even the covid uh, that is the virus that produce corona virus has been proved to be passed for via stools so you have to be very protective when you are going to do even a parietal examination or a proctoscopy so that is very important the take home message is you should have a ppe when you are doing a proctoscopy in an outpatient procedure if you are able to do an outpatient procedure and identify a bleeding probably a, a causes and an ulcer there or an bleeding hemorrhoids there and you can avoid the patient of stent pa or it can avoid the patient of be sent for a proper complete colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy that can be done if you can identify that in your outpatient or in an emergency clinic one a chronic constipation 
like we have discussed in this uh, eight year old gentleman first do all the non diag non invasive procedures like doing a proper ct or an mr then identify a lesion if there is a lesion if you are not able to identify a lesion then go ahead and then do a colonoscopy because the patient is going to the colonoscopy can be taken after all this covid sequence has been avoided that is after a pre probably a period of 3 months or 6 months later if there is not anything that's going to be causing an emergency situation if it is going to be an obstructive lesion like a malignancy then there is a reason where you will have to do a proper colonoscopy to take a tissue diagnosis and then for that which you should have done under a ga the proper protection and 25 year old or 3 week diarrhea or bloody diarrhea again or do all the non invasive procedures before you venture on doing a proper colonoscopy and chronic anemia or a foreign body that is uh, fob that's positive here i would not venture on doing a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy immediately because this is not a life threatening situation again thank as you, i mentioned you. colonoscopy is going to be done for a colonic malignancy after doing a proper non investigative ct or a non invasive ct or an mri before you venture on doing a colonoscopy thank you i think we have only 10 more minutes i have four more areas to be covered quickly and i require uh, satipriya to quickly tell his views on uh, surveillance screening and therapeutic colonoscopy role during the covid era over to satipriya hello can you hear me yes clear go ahead uh, satipriya uh, i think uh, what govindraj is already more or less he uh, talked about all these things is fine only bloody diarrhea in very acute severe ulcerative colitis ibd if you suspect we will go for that to collect see the situation and take the biopsy and esd some of the cases which are resectable locally we may think about that that's also questionable for other cases we should defer and wait for the situation to improve and go for the test that's the Thank you. summary that's very nicely said and coming to the uh, spew words about therapeutic ERCP and advanced uh, procedures uh, coming and uh, thanks uh, boss for sharing your uh, slides on OT setup and uh, let us move on to ERCP. I have three or four index cases here and what's his view, Subhas, on doing this case? Where you will do? Where you will wait? Uh, I <clears throat> uh, well, uh, therapeutic ERCP as a routine is I will simply say no. Uh, if there is a very strong indication that the patient is septic, patient is on hypoxic, the patient is on a ventilator with obstructive joint and septic shock, and if he is little stable, I may have to put a stent. So a therapeutic endoscopy may be done in a patient with uh, obstructive joint with cholangitis only when the patient is really suffering. If he has a very small Uh, floating calculus in the CBD or the calculus without any joints, without any sepsis, I think we can wait. But the procedure must restrict ourselves to a very quick, simple um, um, uh, stenting with limited stuff, as uh, Dr. Gurinder says in the uh, operation theatre, and all precautions to be taken. All precautions taken. Another one indication which I will say is if the patient has unluckily uh, a bile leak, I may have to put a stent in that patient. Otherwise, a mild gall gallstone pancreatitis, small CBD cal, no jaundice, small uh, cal uh, cal with uh, normal LFT. Probably, I will not do any um, any ERCP. Uh, ERCP may also be needed in a patient with uh, ja jaundice due to malignancy of the belly tree, provided there is a sepsis. If there is no sepsis, these patients can later on undergo direct uh, surgery rather than putting a stent in these patients. Thank you, thank you, Subha. I would ask Vipul to tell a few of his uh, points regarding the role of pancreatic endotherapy, spike glass, EUS in this uh, COVID era, Vipul. <coughs> yeah, well, Ishwar, uh, regarding the pancreatic endotherapy, when I say pancreatic endotherapy, specifically means uh, uh, intervention in pancreatic duct for recurrent acute pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis. I think all these patients can wait. We can defer this for few weeks because chronic pancreatitis or recurrent acute pancreatitis is a problem happening to patients for quite some time. So this is something which I would wait. Spy glass cholangioscopy. We all know 
that routine up ERCP as uh, Subhash well, very well mentioned that routine ERCP with a quick stenting and come out or probably brushing would be an ideal situation uh, rather than uh, extending your procedure time with a spyglass because spyglass endoscopy can take a little additional time. You need to do a little more wider sphincterotomy. So I would defer a spyglass because it's a, it's a planned procedure. Mainly we are doing it for either a Mirizzi syndrome sometimes or we are doing for a cholangiocarcinoma biopsy or indeterminate biliary stricture. So we can defer that also. Regarding EUS guided interventions, I would definitely not perform an EUS or FNA for a pancreatic head lesion. And I'll rather rely on a CT, uh, a good quality CT angiogram for the staging of the lesion. If it's a resectable lesion, anyway, we don't need a biopsy. If there is a large lesion which is inoperable on a CT, then perhaps we can just wait and uh, wait and tide over the crisis of COVID. Regarding pancreatic fluid collection and WOPN, if there is infection in the WOPN and if patient needs a drainage, I think we can take this patient with full protection and COVID uh, compliance protocol as far as PT uh, is concerned. So we can offer this patient some of the procedures, but vast majority we can defer. Thank you, thank you. That's nicely said there, Vipul. And uh, I request uh, Professor VKR to give a final say regarding the role of uh, therapeutic ERCP and advanced procedures. Sir, would you like to add anything more on this discussion at this point? Or I shall proceed further? A designated COVID hospital. I would like to refer these cases to that COVID hospital where these procedures can be done. Because if you're going to do for one patient, your expenses of the personal protection is quite high and you getting infected is also a possibility. So it all depends upon the availability of a COVID designated hospital to do these emergent endoscopic procedures. But the expertise may not be there in the COVID hospital. That is uh, another aspect we need to consider. The expertise may be suggest, sitting in a non-COVID hospital. I would suggest that the specialist goes to, non, to the COVID hospital and does it there rather than trying to do it in his own hospital. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And let us come to the final few slides. Uh, we should not underestimate the importance of the endoscopy, cleaning, and the disinfection protocol because safety of our staffs are important. I request Vijay to say some few salient features regarding endoscopy disinfection during COVID era. Over to Vijay. Vijay? Oh, yes. yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. Carry on. Regarding the yes. disinfection the, protocol. Yes. After uh, the endoscopy disinfection or the reprocessing of the endoscope is a very important part in our uh, endoscopy. The, after we, and particularly in the COVID era, after we finish the endoscopy, the endoscopes, the first step in the disinfection, it, the endoscope should be mopped externally to take away all the debris. Then the next step I will request is to take out all the buttons of the endoscope and put the air water channel uh, cleaner and irrigate this scope for three to four minutes with clear water and air. Thank you. At the same time, we can aspirate some. Uh... Yes. We, lost we can go to the next. Yeah, yeah we can go to the next issue. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. So I would uh, conclude by saying endoscopy requires, as usual, a high-level disinfection. But our accessories, either they have to be disposed or they need a proper sterilization, where we should not uh, have any compromise. Goindraj, regarding care of our endoscopy room, Goindraj, can you say what do you yeah. do? Yeah, this is, uh, as I said, the PPE is not only for the people who perform the procedure. It is 
I mean health workers, it means all our people who are going to dispose the biomedical waste also are included in this health worker. So when you are doing a patient of a therapeutic endoscopy in this COVID era, a proper PPE should be given to the healthcare workers who are going to dispose the biomedical waste also. And uh, that is the first point I would say. And the suction unit. And the suction unit is one of the important areas where you have an aerosol generating area. So there, whatever the common solutions, that's the bleaching powder, the 0.5% of the hypochlorite solution should be at least the 10 ml to 20 ml should be there in the suction container. That should be filled up with the 0.5% of the hypochlorite solution. 15 to 20 ml should be filled up in the suction container bottle or the container or the jar. And the endoscopy table, we have to use disposable covers. Over your regular linen, you try to use disposable covers, which can be completely disposed of. And as you do for your regular hand, soap solution or a hypo or a sanitizer, which is very important. And negative, yeah, that is very important. I think uh, Subhash has to tell the next point. I request Subhash to tell, because there are a lot of recommendations okay. regarding having a negative pressure room for endoscopy. Can we achieve in our setup, uh, Subhash, what's your view on that? Uh, thank you, Shura. Well, uh, what we are practicing all these years in most of the operation theatres, that's a view of my, uh, my theatre, uh, is a positive pressure uh, in all the ORs and all the operation theatres. The uh, air comes fifth, at uh, 15 cycles. Uh, per hour from the upper diffuser, uh, you can see the upper diffuser uh, where there's perforations that passes through the HEPA filters and comes down directly to the operation table. And then it goes through the corner grills and uh, it's sucked out. So there's a pressure gradient inside so that the uh, corridor air cannot enter, rather this air goes in. That was for the safety of the patient getting infected, positive pressure uh, operation theaters. Today, we are talking about negative pressure. This negative pressure operation theaters uh, were first introduced after the SARS 2003. Uh, here, what we are looking at, uh, earlier the positive pressure is good enough to save the patient and to save the, all the staff inside the OT from cross-contamination. Today, we are talking about the people in the corridor and adjacent areas. So if we have to save them, the first of all, the operation theater has to be airtight. The air flows from the top Maybe may not be there. You may have to suck out the air one from these vents on the walls in the lower part because when the air will come from above, all the uh, it's presumed that uh, all the infected material re at, remains at a level or your nose level is about 1.6 meter above the floor floor level. So all this uh, infected or so-called contaminated aerosol uh, generated air passes out through these vents or through these grills. And, but then you have to have strong exhaust somewhere here. Apart, along with that, you have to have a HEPA filter. So whatever air which is generated, infected air inside the OR, which is tightly, tightly <laughs> airtight, passes out and it passes through the HEPA filter so that the, all the people in the adjacent areas are safe. So that's the concept of the negative OR. If you have four, five operation theaters, one of them you can convert into uh, a negative uh, air uh, air pressure operation theater. If you are yours is a COVID designated uh, hospital. If it is not a COVID COVID hospital, probably it's good enough to have this with less number of staff inside the operation theater and, and the adjacent areas. Thank you, thank you, Subha. That's nicely explained. Now coming to the final slide. After the endoscopy, we need to take care of our patients and also our health of our healthcare professionals. I request Sajay Priya how he would follow the patients who have undergone emergency or urgent endoscopy recently and how he could monitor the health of the healthcare professionals regularly. Yeah, I feel even after all these things, now it's still not it was very practicable, at least in Kolkata, to do all the test before endoscopy procedure. So we'll take all the precaution as mentioned already, but still after seven to 14 days, we'll take care of the patients, whether any symptoms are coming on or not, and by teleconsultation and any COVID symptom, anything if comes out, I also watch our healthcare workers who are working with me and myself 
whether anything is coming for us or not and if anything comes we should go for self quarantine i think it's very important and uh, so that's uh, the with the scopy the thing end doesn't end there another 14 days follow up is a necessity to cover up us so that nothing is coming up and we are not going for unexpected infection that's all thank you sir and thank we you. must e record everything all the document of the patient should be properly documented so that if it's wanted we can give what we have done what we have done everything thank you thank you i think i thank all the panelists now i wanted the final words of wisdom and pearls of wisdom from all of our panelists i'll start with the professor krishna rao and then followed by the rest of the panelists krishna rao sir would you like to add some final yes. words of wisdom from your side regarding flexible endoscopy during covid what is the take home message from you take home message is that unless it is a, a urgent endoscopy should be avoided and all that we have discussed today pertains to a patient who has infection we this what we have discussed is bound to change in the next 3 to 6 months because the infection will alter come down and may disappear and again we have to protect ourselves by examining and investigating our patients for viral diseases like hepatitis b hiv and now for covid all these must become a routine investigation before any procedure is done this uh, whatever the guidelines we are giving it today is based on the knowledge of the disease as we know today it is bound to change in the period of time in the next 3 to 6 months and i think we should update our membership if there are any changes in our uh, guidelines thank you sir subhas would you like to thank sir uh, i agree i yeah i agree with professor kishan uh, what uh, sir said uh, adding to him i feel that the trias area is going to be very very good uh, very very strong recommendation have a trias area outside your er as we said uh, this is going to be very very important to save you if you do not want if you do not want the our operation our hospital to be locked down so you have a trias area first and where the trias to be done by by the staff with complete ppe Uh, strongly in, uh, i will strongly uh, uh, mention or recommend uh, telephonic uh, uh, consultations for the time being the senior doctors and all the senior among us should avoid the physical consultation as much as possible the more important than that probably uh, i have given the link to my staff today the staff needs to be also trained they do not know that after the procedure they have to do a sanitization of the operation table of the all the surroundings including the 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 endoscopy trolley and all so that's also important we must be prepared for the next 6 months to 1 year we may have to uh, come do a routine test for all our patients so we should be gradually switching over as soon as possible to routine preoperative testing for all our cases that's all i want to add here now thank you thank kishore you, thank you thank you sir sachi priya would you like to say What's One thing views? only, still we are not still uh, with our test tests are rampant and even testing is a very tiring thing. If you ask also, they are not doing the testing. So that in that case, take all the patients as a COVID positive patients like that and treat it like that with all the precaution we have discussed. Vipul, would you like to add? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, our all our uh, panelists have spoken so well. I would like to just say one thing today: that unless and until we have a definitive cure for COVID or a definitive vaccine for COVID, office endoscopy is going to be a very very difficult proposition. And endoscopy will have to be done in a very protected, a surgical environment. This is what I feel. So that outpatient op- office endoscopy, which people used to do in their OPD, is 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 going to be going away for for some time till we have a cure or a vaccine. This is my feeling. Thank you, thank you, Goindraj. What's your uh, to add on to Vipul? Uh, one thing is there is no urgency in this kind of a pandemic. So you have to get protected before you do anything heroic. 
get yourself your staff protected before doing number 2 is whatever guidelines the panelists have told it's a dynamic disease the guidelines are changing every day the protocols are changing every day as we learn more about the disease so whatever we say today might not be the same thing one month later so we are in a dynamic state of changing the protocol as far as iag is concerned so the all the uh, audience here they should understand what we are speaking is only for today standards we don't know what is the standard that's going to be for tomorrow or for day after tomorrow thank you thank you thank you finally vijay would you like to add any more uh, uh, yes uh, only one thing that uh, in this covid era pandemic we have to protect ourselves our we have to protect our patients as well by not doing the endoscopies when not required and also uh, take care of our staff people and uh, hopefully this phase will go away and we shall have some uh, better future in ahead thank you thank you thank you i think uh, before we go in for our recommendations and conclusion i should uh, uh, tell all our audience and also panelists uh, the uh, all the references we have taken from all the directives one of them actually from the joint indian societies guidelines and also the european and american guidelines we have taken and uh, i could uh, conclude by saying at least three or four important recommendations we should defer all elective endoscopy number 2 we should confine ourselves doing only emergency and urgent endoscopy and always we should assume or every patient walking in as a covid positive and act accordingly and we should ensure n95 mask quality ppe are must for every healthcare professionals covid endoscopy concern form is very essential we have to keep it as a very important medical legal document and all our endoscopic procedures should be done under ga with endotracheal intubation i think this is these are the six take home messages and we should all collectively work to confront this covid crisis of course using our common sense and compassion and go through this and come out as a winning lot and thank you all and let us see some questions before we leave the meeting and there are one or two questions one question was addressed to subhas because he was discussing on the teleconsultation are you using any special application mobile app or what do you suggest for an effective teleconsultation okay uh, i am using a um, uh, teledoc uh, a mobile app and also i am using a uh, telerobo uh, uh, gina bring that here Uh, I can show you daily robot. Not I, today when I have to go for rounds to my ICU, I'll be going, going on rounds with my daily daily robot. I can show the daily robot here. Can you bring it quickly, please? Jina, jaldi le aap. So this is how I am consulting my patients in the hospital. Also, I am not going to the rooms. I can just take my robot from here, and uh, this robot can uh, go to the room, and the patient can talk to me. Uh, I think you can see the robot here. Uh, it's with me here. so this is the robo which goes to the room and uh, and the patient can see me and talk to me this is one second i will strong distinct when today i will strongly recommend a telephonic consultation and most important is on the phone only the the the, uh, the we have to decide whether the patient is real in emergency and where he needs to go it may be so that he is in crisis and he need to be shifted to a covid hospital so that is very very important but the moment the patient enters our tele tele doc or our software he gives a consent i give a consent yes are you ready to consult so he give a consent so the consent is automatically taken the moment he goes to tele doc and uh, there was a small clarification they wanted from dr goindraj in the endoscopy room while we are disinfecting what how will you disinfect the suction bottle you have to fill the suction bottle with a chlorine solution hypochlorite solution that's what the question what's your view on that goindraj or any any of the panelist yeah uh, see for in this covid era there are no guidelines for the suction bottle disinfection so it is a guideline for all the disinfection for that matter a hypochlorite solution you can use like in a pest control spray the entire uh, room should be sprayed and uh, uh, as you do in an operating room you have an uh, vircon uh, uh, mist sprayed over in the room and for the suction bottle part, uh, bottle in particular you wash it with a hypochlorite solution 
following which if it is a jar you can then eat you or sterilize it or you can eat you or sterilize it it's a bottle this is can be done in case of an suction jar you can eat you or sterilize it in case if it's a bottle you apply the hypochlorite solution to that and completely rinse it with hypochlorite solution there is another question addressed to you can we reuse the n95 mask if so how many times they were asking see n95 mask if you are going to the should not be reused but even in countries like the us they have got standard guidelines which i saw a few days before from the cdc itself how they can reuse the n95 mask and uh, the n95 mask if you are going to give it a health worker they advise you to give a minimum of 5 n95 mask labeling it as day 1 day 2 day 3 for day 4 and day 5 if a health worker is using a day 1 n95 mask over an n95 mask he has to wear a regular three layered mask and at the end of the day that is at the end of the day he removes the day 1 mask and he can lift leave the n95 mask in a complete air drying you don't need to do any other thing air dry it in a complete uh, setup in a keeping it open and in a paper cover or in a polythene cover you can air dry the n95 mask and day 2 you do the do second mask day 3 use the third mask and your first day mask will come back to you on day 6 so by that you are do not using the mask for 72 hours they tell the time of 72 hours air drying your mask is enough if you have to reuse the mask and minimum of 3 weeks you can use the mask for a minimum of 3 weeks and a maximum of 4 weeks can be done in this way you can use a mask that is a mask for minimum of 3 to 4 times okay. and there is a one question for satipriya do you think even for colonoscopy we have to do under ga that's a question we people seems to be agreeing with the statement that we have to do endotracheal intubation general anesthesia for upper gi endoscopy ercp but what about colonoscopy satipriya or would any people would what's your comment yes. one of you yes yes i so, feel i feel uh, both uh, colonoscopy also now as you know that the feces also contains the rna that virus particles though we are not sure that there is infective or not and that causes lots of air so lots of air we have to give inflate and then we have to go and so we have to do it we have to give less distension sucking out the thing during colonoscopy more and more making it low loop and try but it's a lengthy procedure i feel uh, the definitely et tube intubation if can be done that's a much better and much safer way Subhash, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, we were worried, worried about uh, the upper GI tract and aero digestive tract. So uh, both way, I will feel I feel that the patient can be put on N95 mask, uh, and uh, if he's safe, uh, both way colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy in sigmoidoscopy we can avoid uh, general anesthesia. I'll ask the people and other panelists to uh, recommend what the uh, recommendation. If 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 your pre pre procedure testing of the patient is COVID negative, I would go one step further. If it's negative, this guy the patient is negative of COVID any infection, perhaps you can get away in a colonoscopy with what the Subhash has mentioned. But in a positive patient, there is no no way we should avoid no way. Patient. I agree. Straight away. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, there is a final question, a sensitive question. I am 65 year old, diabetic. Can I continue to do endoscopy? I think probably Kishore Avsar can tell himself, or uh, who wants to give the answer for this question? A serious question. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he has a comorbidity he is 65 today's recommendation in general all over all guy all uh, guidelines say above 65 with comorbidity i say he should not be doing he should not be doing he can this year we can say it is desirable just to confine and let uh, the juniors extras to take over uh, hmm? not mandatory but desirable desirable yeah. Yeah. i think with that question there are uh, a lot of appreciation for all our panelists uh, having a very uh, crisp and clear discussion on this very important topic uh, for surgeons because as iags as you all know we are doing both uh, 
in the structured basic and advanced endoscopic training program for the last four years. Thanks to all our endoscopic surgeons assembled here as a panelist. And uh, I think we are all proud as IAGS members and also our president and on behalf of our, the EC, I thank all the panelists, all the members and all the viewers who joined in this webinar and make it a very useful interactive session. And uh, together, I think we should be able to get over this crisis, go for a, a normal life sooner rather than later. And with that concluding remarks, I thank you again, once again, and let us leave this meeting. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you thank much. you, moderator, thank you. for thank excellent you. moderating. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, all eminent panelists, for your valuable time. Thank you so much. It was great to have you all here.